All right, everybody, welcome back to the Lumen Patria Karm, where we are trying to live as intentional Catholic men. And I'm excited today to introduce and to uh, bring into the, uh, the Lumen Patria Karm, uh, Timothy S. Flanders of The Meaning of Catholic. Timothy S. Flanders is the editor-in-chief and the founder of The Meaning of Catholic uh, Lay Apostolate. You should check out their website. He's also an author of an introduction to the Holy Bible for traditional Catholics, which I finally got. I'm about a third of the way through it, and it's uh, it's an awesome book. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about, well, a lot of bit about the stuff that's in that book tonight. He's also a contributor to many Catholic websites in the Catholic sphere. So again, thanks, Tim, for for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, brother. Praise to Jesus Christ. Absolutely, Amen. Well, Tim, uh, if you don't mind, go ahead and get started in prayer. We'll do as we always do. We'll pray our intercessory prayer to St. Joseph. All right. Nomini Patris et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. O St. Joseph, whose protection is so great, so strong, so prompt before the throne of God, I place in you all my interests and desires. O St. Joseph, do assist me by your powerful intercession and obtain from me, from your divine Son, all spiritual blessings through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that having engaged here below your heavenly power, I may offer my thanksgiving and homage to the most loving of fathers. O St. Joseph, I never weary contemplating you and Jesus asleep in your arms. I dare not approach while he reposes near your heart. Press him in my name and kiss his fine head for me and ask him to return the kiss when I draw my dying breath. St. Joseph, patron of departing souls, pray for us. Amen. 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 All right. So, Tim, I hate to start this off on the negative, but we got to paint a picture. And uh, unfortunately, that picture is kind of grim these days. So just for our listeners, um, real quick, we have a, a, a huge dearth in Catholic education when it comes to the Catholic lady and especially in Catholic men. Um, what is the problem? Where do we start and how do we fix it? That's what we're here to talk about today. And I'm just going to lay out some basic snapshots. And, and Tim, if you'd like to, to uh, chime in afterwards and just kind of fill us in on how you feel about this. Um, seven in 10 Catholics believe that the Eucharist is just a symbol. These are all taken from Pew Research. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, and if you've been hiding under a rock uh, over the last couple of years, you've heard that statistic numerous times. 56% of Catholics are pro-abortion. That is a humongous, um, uh, a very terrible statistic, especially with the upcoming election. Um, another Pew Research article entitled uh, Facts About American Catholics, fact number two and number five are, are pretty stark, but number two especially, um, we're losing 13% uh, of our Catholic membership every year, and we are only, you know, gaining 8%. A year, so that's that's pretty stark. I, I would say um, we're we're almost losing half of our, we're only gaining back half of what we lose every year, uh, which I hate looking at things as a you know a numbers game, but um, that's pretty stark uh, considering. Um, it seems to me like we're not getting any sound teaching from the pulpit. Um, we had, there's a lot of ambiguity. It's part of the reason my wife and I ventured back or ventured over, I should say, to the to start attending the traditional Latin mass. Uh, we just felt like we were getting fed the truth. There wasn't like a half truth going on there. Um, and um, yeah, there's just a lot of issues, Tim. That's what it seems like, at least to me. Yeah, we're facing what our fathers have faced before us. The breakdown of society, the breakdown of the church, the corruption of the Vatican. This is we might say the third pornocracy after the Renaissance pornocracy of the papacy and the 10th century pornocracy, which was the deep corruption of the Vatican, both financially, morally, sexually, doctrinally, hmm. into an apparatus that was serving Satan instead of the true God. And this is the situation that we're in. And when, when the well-oiled machine, which is the Vatican, becomes no longer fueled with the Holy Spirit, but with the evil spirit, it begins to 
dissipate the whole breast of the mystical body of Christ through the hierarchy and down to the people. And we're in a situation that has had a give and take between the church and society, the society and the church back and forth, where there has been somewhat of a surrendering on the side of the church to the secular society in the past few generations, which has allowed it to seek finally its, its ultimate end in pure paganism. And so we have the resurgence of paganism in many different forms, child sacrifice, uh, debauchery, the hatred of parents, the destruction of the generational bond between <laughs> generations. And I view that particular thing right there, the generational bond to be the crux of the matter, mm. which has been weakening since really the reformation in all of society and cultural momentum, but really began to break out after the secular revolutions of America, France, and Ireland, and later all of Europe. And that began to really break down the culture of Christendom so that we're in a, in a place now that any, any family that raises their children as Catholics has to swim against the tide. Mm. Is that um, when you talked about generations there, you know, you spoke about this uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe in one of your podcasts uh, based off your book, uh, you talked about generations and piety um, to many Catholics out there to include myself for the longest time. You know, we thought that uh, when I, when I thought of piety, I pictured, you know, um, the old ladies in the front of the church, you know, praying their rosary all the time, you know, that's not what piety is per se. Can you explain uh, what you meant by piety and kind of talk about how that has impacted the generations? And, and uh, on top of that, how do we get that back? Yeah. I, I mean, I think that this is, this is the problem and so solution in my, in my view. Um, this is something that I touch on in the book, in the introduction of the Bible, but this is going to be the main theme of the book I'm currently writing. It'll be released next year for TAN. All right, Ed. And it basically breaks down like this. There are four elements of culture. Culture is the cultus, which is the religious rite. It is the oral tradition, which explains what the religious rite is, or explains the morality from the, the rite itself. And then there are the elders, the office of elders, whether that's the parents or the public priesthood or what have you, the king. And then there is piety. Piety is what allows that whole system to be passed down to the next generation. Piety is a virtue defined by St. Thomas as giving to each one his due, giving to one's elders their due. So the fourth commandment is honor thy father and thy mother. So we have uh, commandments one, two, three are all about God and the cultus of God and worshiping God. And then commandment four is the hinge which allows the whole society to propagate itself through generations. If you don't have commandment number four, you're just going to have, and you actually have this in the Holy scriptures. You have this when, when God destroys the entire generation that came out of Egypt. And then that generation goes into the promised land, but then that generation does not actually pass it down to that, the third generation. And that's uh -huh. the key break that happens in the book of judges in the very beginning that there arose, says arose another generation that did not know the Lord. Mm. And that's because they failed to have, whatever happened there, they either failed to have piety to receive the tradition coming down to them, or their parents failed to teach it to them. Uh -huh. And so this, this fourth element of culture is the crucial piece, because if you don't have the piety, then the entire culture is, just evaporates immediately out of one generation. So the whole point is to try to create this cultural momentum so that everyone is united in the cultus and what Christopher Dawson says, the, what is called the moral principle of society, which is the religious cultus, the religious right, which forms this matrix of morality and mores. And that goes for everything. It goes not just for faith and morals, but it goes into little things like how, how do you dress mm. fashions, 
architecture, music, food, cuisine, dancing, all these other things are, are seemingly little things, but they're all tied to oral culture. You don't, you, you don't, there's not a book that you are passed down where you, you're taught as a man how to tie a tie. You're taught by your father. He tells you how to tie that tie. And mm-hmm. tying the tie is, is a symbol that communicates to the rest of society who you are and what is expected of you. If you're wearing a tie, you're expected to act in a certain way, you know, at least, you know, more and more, you know, more 50 years ago, but even today still, you know, if you're wearing a, a suit and a tie, you're expected to act more properly than somebody who's, you know, sagging his jeans or whatever, you know, you wouldn't <laughs> expect that person to act the same way. And so these are all things that are, these are just oral customs, which communicate morality and social mores and the way that we respect each other that gets passed down. So these four elements of culture and piety is the crucial piece. My view is that when you create a society, which is based on anti-piety, which is based on revolting against the prior generation, then you create something that, that I term anti-culture and anti-culture is not actually real culture. It's it because you have to have these four elements of culture. And I emphasize that you can have these four elements of culture in a non-Christian setting. You, because this is a universal thing on the natural level. You have Islamic culture. They have a culture. They've got those four elements. Hindu culture, whatever. All these other cultures, they have these things because they have these four elements. But we, what we have in the Western, Western history from the secular, secular revolutions in particular into the 19th century, you have the creation of anti-culture where you have something where they start, they start passing down revolution itself and revolution as a moral good where, Mm -hmm. and revolution is basically anti-piety. And so you have, you have this, you have this anti-culture that's getting passed down. And if you pass down the ideal of rebelling against your parents, if you teach that to the children, if you teach your children, it's the ideal to rebel against your parents. What are they going to do? They're going to rebel against your parents. <laughs> They're going to rebel against you. And every single, every successive generation, it starts picking up speed. And now in the 20th century, it's, 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 it's just a snowball now. So that every new generation, you see it because we, we laugh at each other about boomers and millennials and this because the generations are completely fractured. There, I mean, people didn't used to think about well, there's this generation, there's this gener- It used to be just, we're all one people. That's because they had culture. But now with anti-culture, it's just fragmented all the generations into all these separate mindsets. And what happens? Every new generation has a new form of music, a new form of dressing, a new form of fashion, a new form of lingo. Everything's new. Every new generation is just restarting everything. And then you have new morality, new philosophy, new art. Everything is just disintegrating every single generation. So this is, as I said, this, this is more something that I'll get into in my next book, but that, that then brings us to the solution because the solution is to create true culture in your family so that you can pass this down to your sons and your daughters. They can receive that and then they can pass it down to the third generation. And so creating that, that bond is, that is the way that we conquer this anti-culture and the secular society, because that's what our fathers did before the Roman empire was conquered by Christ before in the early church, when our fathers were martyred left and right, Mm -hmm. they created a culture within their families that was against this hostile world. And that's what we need to do again. Gotcha. So almost kind of in a nutshell, putting a bow on that, you would say uh, to an extent, I guess, piety is, is paying homage to the, to the past. It's, it's remembering the past and it's trying to live that, that past and bringing it to the forefront. Correct? Quick. quick uh, oh yeah. It's, so okay, it's cool. piety to the past. <laughs> it's everything, everything your fathers did, said, made, thought. It's giving piety and reverence to that. So, 
so giving a yeah humble attitude and honoring of that so that we can receive that with reverence, learn from its wisdom. And we can, once we do that, then we can also add our own touch to it. Gotcha. And that's when we add our touch to it as well. Like a per- perfect example of, of this is the architecture because the cathedrals that stand today are a monument to the beauty, the true beauty, true truth, goodness, and beauty of Christendom. And those things were made over sometimes hundreds of years. And so you're, my father would just, my father would die and pass on. I would have to pick up his work and continue working on this cathedral. And then I would die. My son would take it up. <laughs> and when you don't have piety, you don't have piety for that. This is why we have a crisis in church music and architecture at the same time as doctrine. Man, it's I all together go. because if you don't have piety at all, because piety is for everything, it's not just for the faith and the morals. It's also for the little things. Sure. So that's why you, with heresy, with the revolutionary um, ideas that we have now, it's just liberal Catholicism or whatever. You also have bad architecture and bad music because it's all just casting aside everything that our fathers had, whether it's music or the doctrine. Yeah, I think uh, I could go on for hours about music. Oh, my my dad and I were just joking about it today. It's it's pretty funny, but uh, um, yeah. As far as architecture is concerned, uh, I agree with you hundred percent. I uh, I mean that's one of the reasons why we came back. Or can't, I keep saying come back, but that's why we started going to the TLM. We just I grew up in a parish that was looked like a gym, you know, as most parishes where I grew up in in Western Washington look like. Or either that or they look like maybe churches from the outside, but uh, you would go inside and there would be nothing in there. There wouldn't be stations of the cross. There wouldn't be, you know, there'd be these really weird modern statues and things like that because someone was trying to reinvent, as you're saying, the wheel that didn't need to be reinvented, right? Someone came in with their own cultists and tried to insert that almost into some of these churches. Um, and our church didn't even have felt banners. So I'd never even seen those for a while, but that's, that's why we have felt banners, I guess it's because of, uh, you know, that thing, but yeah, there just seems to be a complete wanting to separate ourselves from that past. You know, the more I talk to, uh, friends of mine that haven't, you know, experienced a, a traditional Latin mass yet. They're very apprehensive to that. Why do you think as, especially the men, um, why do you think as Catholic men nowadays we're so apprehensive uh, to that piety? Why is it so hard for us to pick it up? And maybe a better way to ask that is how does one after realizing, oh no, like I, I don't even know my history. I don't even know my past. I don't know how to pay homage to that past. You know, because a lot of us, unfortunately, uh, you know, um, a lot of my friends, they grew up in very broken homes where they didn't have a good example of a father, you know. So how does one rediscover that piety? A couple questions there. Sorry about that. Yeah, well, that's (laughs) why, why I think the biggest reason why it's a difficult, painful struggle is because we want control over our own lives. We want freedom to and assert our own will. We want freedom to impose our will on nature and the will of God itself. We don't want someone else to impose their will because that's what piety is, is allowing your fathers to impose their will on you first Mm -hmm. before you start to do anything yourself. And so that's humbling because nobody wants that because they want to be independent. They want to be free, especially if you are a slave to sin. If you're a slave to some sin in particular, you don't want to have an authority tell you what to do. That's scary. That's terrifying because it threatens your control over yourself. So the, but ultimately I think that especially for men, I think men respond very well to a desire for truth, mm. a desire for what is true. There is truth, goodness, and beauty. I think women have a great sensitivity to beauty. They, much more than men do, men are often very obtuse to beauty. But 
men have a very strong inclination towards truth and a rational argumentation. And so when you, when you sit down and explain to a man, two plus two cannot equal five, it has to always equal four every time. Many times they'll say, well, I guess that makes sense. Maybe reluctantly, if, if number four answer is going to challenge their way of life. Sure. So this type of argumentation can, I, can, I think, be powerful for men. I, I can speak for myself in being a Protestant heretic for most of my life. I was challenged by pious Catholics and they forced me to look at things in a new way. And I was challenged by truth. I think that that is a very strong challenge. That's the biggest challenge for a man. I think truth so to really speak, be speak challenged. By tr- yeah. Speaking, uh, speaking plainly, I think that, that, uh, that definitely, cause, yeah, cause on the one hand, men are repulsed by sort of the effeminate soft approach of so-called mercy, but it's really not mercy of the sort of what I call the gospel of psychology, that type of thing. But we, and we would like the tough manliness, but then it also scares us because we don't really, we don't really want to be under the authority of another man. And that's, that's pretty terrifying because the other thing is we live in a totally male dominant society which allows men to completely dominate and fulfill their lusts in this depraved world with absolutely no consequences. Mm. And so when a man faces up to another man, I remember when (laughs) I remember when I was a Protestant and I, and I was actually taught because I had become Eastern Orthodox and I, I was a Protestant. I remember talking to an Eastern Orthodox priest for the first time. And I was so terrified because my Bible and me were really the magisterium. It was all about me and my Bible and talking to a priest and, you know, this Orthodox priest with a beard, you know, an old man. (laughs) And, uh, it's just, it's scary when you, when you face up to somebody like that, Mm -hmm. because then it's just like, you can't, you can't really, as a man, when you, when you face an, an older man who's older and wiser and he's not intimidated by you, you know, none of your pretenses are going to work now. (laughs) Yeah, that's scary. I think for many men who are living in sin, as I was. Oh yeah. So I think I mean those are some of the reasons I think because the Latin Mass, the Latin Mass will kick your teeth out, man. Oh yeah. And so <laughs> you, you, that's scary. You know, if you've never taken a hit like that, that's pretty scary. So I think that that's very challenging, and and it's a lot easier for men to run to Eastern Orthodoxy or run to Anglicanism or whatever. And many of them are because there is what's called the emergent movement in Protestantism right now where Protestants are becoming these things, but they don't want to become Catholic ultimately because becoming Catholic ultimately is the, the ultimate man, which who's the Pope has to check your pride as a man. And that's terrifying. That's especially tough nowadays. Uh, I think with our current, our current uh, pontificate, it's hard to uh, to bite bite your tongue sometimes and be charitable, right? Something you and I talked about too, and uh, you know before was was charity and how we lack that charity. Um, I'd like to get into that in just a second as well, but uh, I love what you said about the uh, the <laughs> the TLM because the first time I ever walked into a um, Eastern Orthodox church after going to just you know, I was in Alaska and, uh, again, mostly Alaskan churches up there. There's just no sense of beauty when you walk in. There's no sense of piety. There's no sense of that tradition. When you look around, uh, nothing about them says Catholic, except for maybe the occasional, you know, stations of the cross or the crucifix, right? That's usually the telltale. Oh, I'm in a Catholic church. Okay. Um, but man, when I walked into that, the, there was a Greek Orthodox church called the church of the Holy Transfiguration and they have an open house. And I walked in and it was a punch in the teeth because of just, just because of the sheer magnitude of what I was looking at when I walked through the door, I had never experienced anything like that. Never. Um, you know, and then now that we go to, um, the TLM, we started going about a year and a half ago now and, um, yeah, it just punches you in the teeth. So, um, 
And then also just, just to kind of agree with you, and, and I'm going to read a statement to you real quick, um, but, uh, and, and you can, you know, let me know how you feel about this, but um, to become Catholic, and especially to become a good Catholic man to um, eradicate some of that effeminacy, you know, inside of us that we struggle with, we have to conform ourselves to the church rather than try to conform the church to ourselves. Yeah, I mean, that reminds me of E. Michael Jones in his seminal work, Degenerate Moderates, where he says, you either conform your desires to the truth or you conform the truth to your desires. Ah. And he's, his thesis is that modernity is rationalized sexual misbehavior. Oh, wow. And <laughs> I think, I mean, the biggest affliction of men is sins of the flesh and sins of the flesh darken your intellect. Mm. So that you don't, you do want to conform the church to yourself because you, your, your intellect is darkened. You're a slave to sins of the flesh and you do not want to stop. St. Augustine said, give me chastity, but not yet. Mm. And that's what the, that's what the, the effeminate sinful man says in his Mm. heart, sort of silently or implicitly. He says, Yes, I, I acknowledge in my intellect that God is, is almighty and he will judge me. And yet I don't quite want to let go of this sinful relationship or sinful pattern or whatever. Or even more insidiously, because passions of the six com- against the sixth commandment are rather obviously sinful, there's also a, a very nefarious vice, which is the vice of curiosity, which mm-hmm. is seeking more knowledge than the duties of your state in life oblige you to obtain. So you, you are always seeking more knowledge than you re- even need. You don't even need all this knowledge. You're, you're just reading all <laughs> these books and you don't even need all this knowledge. And it's making you prideful. And it's making you think that you know everything. So you're going on the internet and you're correcting all these people about how, well, all the bad things that they don't understand and you're going on and on. Meanwhile, you're, you're just being puffed up. St. Paul says, knowledge puffeth up. Mm. Charity edifieth. So you have no charity. You're just puffed up in your own knowledge. And that in particular, I think that is a very corrupting vice for men. Because, and all of this is, I'm, I'm just speaking for myself. So I, I, have this, I, I only know these sins because I've committed them myself. Sure. Um, <laughs> and so this corrupting pride is particularly insidious because it can be such a seemingly righteous zeal, but it's really the zeal of the Pharisees because the Pharisees had great knowledge and they had great learning and passion for their doctrine. And yet our Lord has the harshest rebukes for them Mm. because they're so consumed with pride that they neglect the poor and mercy to those and they just glory in themselves. The, the parable of the Pharisee where he goes and prays, and then he says, Lord, I thank you that I am great. It's a prayer to himself. <laughs> He's praying to himself, basically. <laughs> yeah. And so that, that's, that's what I think is incredibly dangerous. And it's particularly, I, I experienced it particularly in the Eastern Orthodox, and there's many Eastern Orthodox who are not like this. But I, I think it's in, in particular extremely dangerous for men because it's easy to get trapped into the Eastern Orthodox trap because the liturgy seems great, the doctrine seems great, and then you get trapped in this cycle of thinking how, how great you are that you're Orthodox, that you're right, <laughs> that you're in the true church and how great that is and how everybody else is a heretic. And thinking those thoughts over and over really... That is, that is really the epitome of, of conforming the church to yourself. Because you, you may even be completely orthodox in your doctrine. I mean, you could be a Roman Catholic. You could believe all the proper beliefs and all the dogmas of the faith. But you could be fulfilling the commandments to God and orthodox doctrine. But St. John says, if you say you love God but hate your brother, you're a liar. Mm. And so... There is such a thing as you could be orthodox in faith, but pagan in morals. And that's, the, that's one of the most difficult 
deceptions because it's based on a, a very satanic pride where you do have orthodox doctrine. You do have, you, I mean, you could have a perfect TLM, perfect Latin mass, everything's perfect, you know, doctrine and everything from the pulpit, but you're corrupted with pride. And so that incense is a stench in God's nostrils, as Isaiah 1 says. And so this is a very dangerous vice that men can get into if they come to even to the true faith. And you see that a lot online, unfortunately, because a lot of these people go online and they just want to correct everyone else because they know so much. I laugh because I, I, I've definitely done that before. Um, and so uh, yeah, the keyboard warrior. Um, it's really hard uh, for men to, you know, and it's, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to go into that as well. The curiosity, you know, reading the scripture with humility. Um, definitely want to talk about that. And, and you do mention, you know, men, we, we want that fight. You know, we want, um, or men, we want to f- want that fight. But sometimes we got to shut our mouths. We got to bite our tongues. <laughs> sometimes it's totally acceptable to walk away from the fight because it's not worth your time. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, I've definitely fallen into that too. You know, you're on your phone and you're like, come on, man. You know, and your kids are like, dad, come jump on the trampoline. You're like, I can't. I'm, I'm trying to win an argument. Like, okay. All right. Yeah, it's time to stop. But yeah, that's, uh, that's a big one. That's a big one. Um, I'm really glad you mentioned that. So kind of going back to what you're saying about curiosity then. Um, so n- number one, you know, I, I'm a firm believer and I, I can't, I can't give to my family or my friends or my parishioners what I don't have, right? I can't give um, to those I love what I do not have. So the knowledge of the faith is one thing, sure. Um, you know, the virtues are another thing. I can't give any of this stuff, you know, uh, to my family if I don't have it. And so kind of just trying to encourage other men um, to learn their faith, uh, to learn about these issues going on, um, because that's another thing I see a lot of is people just kind of burying their head in the sand and not really paying attention to what's actually going on Um, and uh, and kind of turning a blind eye and it's all going to be fine. And and I'm just talking about the church, guys. I'm not talking about COVID. I'm not talking about all this other stuff, by the way. But um, where do we start with gaining in, in education, uh, not, just a, uh, not just a book smart education, but a spiritual education that we can give that to our families? Where do we start with that? Great question. Um, I think it starts with understanding that knowledge puffeth up and charity edifieth. Because as you're mentioning that I, that I discuss in my book on the Holy Bible, I'm trying to bring the truths of the imitation of Christ to bear because that book was written when there was a decline in scholasticism. There was St. Thomas a couple generations before imitation, and then it had de- degenerated into just this, this Occam nominalism and a bunch of useless academia, which was not really like St. Thomas was. And Thomas Akempis comes to town and he starts writing against this, the folly of this learning and just endless, endless quibbles instead of a virtuous life. So I think what you're saying is, is so important because like we've talked about here, men can fall into these vices of curiosity. And so that's why you need to get your spiritual life in order, which is the foundation of your entire, all of your life personally. And then, becomes also then the foundation of the family. The, a man's spiritual life is the foundation of the family. And that is essential. A man needs to protect himself. He needs to take care of himself spiritually. Like you said, you cannot give what you do not have. So you need to gain that. A pious practice of many men, many of our fathers, is a rising earlier, ra- ra- raising yourself up earlier than your family, getting up earlier, your family's asleep, you wake up first and you start offering to God the sacrifice of praise. You offer to God reparations for your own sins and the w- sins of your wife and children. It's, your, it's on you. It's on your head. 
you are going to be judged for your wife and children. You heard it here, gentlemen. You so you need, to, you need to think about that. Think about the flames of hell and mm-hmm. the desire to offer to God a good def- what they say in the Eastern Rite, a good defense before the dread judgment seat of Christ. Mm-hmm. And St. Paul says, we will all stand before the tribunal of Christ. And so you, God has made you responsible, man, of yourself, your wife, and your children. And you are responsible for them. So you will answer for your own soul and their souls. And so that's why we get up earlier than them, because it's our responsibility. And so getting, I think that men respond very well to duty when they are really challenged to do their duty. And that's, I think, when a man has this very strong sense of duty, he is able to overcome difficulties to do his duty because he has a strong sense of that. And so understanding your duties as a man are very, it's very important. You have a duty as a man to provide materially and spiritually for your family. So your wife doesn't have to go out and work because you don't make enough money. You got to get an extra job or two and work those jobs. So your wife can be free to be a mother and your children can be free to have a mother. And those are your duties and your duties to protect them as well. Protect them from the demons protect them from evil Marxist BLM riders (laughs) coming to town and your duty is to protect them and to be the rock. Perhaps most importantly is to be that rock, both spiritually, emotionally, rationally. You have to be the rock for your wife. Your wife needs you to be the rock. Your wife is repelled when you melt in an effeminate mess. Hmm. Your wife is repelled by that. She needs you to be the rock. So how do you do that? How do you do this? What we're trying to get at is getting your spiritual life in order. And it it, it means overcoming your own effeminacy, which is effeminacy is different than femininity, different thing. Effeminacy is an attachment to pleasure which causes us to be reluctant to suffer. So we want to fulfill our duties, but we're attached to this pleasure. And it it may not, we've talked about sins of the flesh, but it could just be your phone or your social media or your emotions or your music or your movies or whatever, or your video games or your sports or whatever. You could just be emotionally attached to those things and then not want to do your duty. Just like, I mean, it was exactly what you just said. You're, you're on the phone trying to win an argument. Your kids want to play on the <laughs> trampoline. That's, that yeah. was, that was, that's a feminacy right there because you're attached yeah. to this thing. You're w- not willing to subordinate your own will to your duties. And that causes suffering. So you're unwilling to suffer because you're attached to the pleasure. That's a feminacy. Yeah. So it is all about getting, getting yourself together, manning up. And I want to emphasize too the importance of man support because men need man support from other men. There is a hierarchy in a family. The, the man is the head of the wife and the wife uh, over the children. And there's a, there's an, in, there's an inequality in the dependence of a man to his wife and his wife, wife to his, to the man, because the man is the one who has to be the rock. So, the woman needs and wants her man to be the man. She does not want to mother him. Mm. Oh man. That's a huge problem nowadays. Yeah. She does not want to mother. That's, that's repulsive to women. Yeah. They want a man. And now, now the man depends on his wife, especially, especially for things regarding the children. Uh, She has far more sensitive and, and prudent judgment on many matters than he does. And he needs to rely on her for a lot of those things. But in terms of his own foundation, his rock, his secure, his insecurities, things that he deals with in particular, he needs man support from other men to open up to particular things that may uh, disrupt 
a family, you know, you need, you need the man support to pour into other men so you can have that brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm, so what I'm, what I'm trying to, trying to get at here is the importance of other men to support you so that you can then support your wife and children and helping you take care of yourself, helping you take care of those things that is, it's really your responsibility to take care of. It, these yeah. are things that your wife should not have to deal with. Your <laughs> wife should not have to deal with all your insecurities and your effeminacy or whatever. She did not have to deal with that. Don't put it on her. Put it on your, your brother because yeah. your brother is going to challenge you to man up and he's actually, he's going to help you. Because iron you, sharpens iron, right? Exactly. So yeah. when you, because when you give that to your, your woman, she then kind of has an instinct, instinct to want to mother you. She doesn't, she, I mean, that's just what she does. She wants to do that. And she's kind of repulsed by that. She doesn't want to do that, you know? <laughs> so, so that's why you give it to your brother and your brother sharpens you. And then you can go back and be the man for your wife and children. And so I want to emphasize that because when we challenge men, it's, it's difficult. And, and we are, as men, we do need support for our own struggles. And there's a certain amount, there's a, there's a certain amount that we do give to our, our woman uh, obviously, but there is a certain amount that we need to give with other men and we need to get that strengthening and that sharpening with other men that we can't really get from a woman. And we shouldn't have to get from a woman. We should need to be, get it from our brothers so that we can really give to our woman and our, and our children. And yeah. so that this is something that is very important, something that you see in Exodus 90, very important yeah. program because Exodus 90 is really built on this brotherhood and this sharpening each other so that you can really challenge each other to man up and overcome an effeminacy and love suffering and have the virtue of mortification, which is, a, which is a, the longing for suffering. And so that brotherhood needs to be in place. And that's, I think, one of the keys because it's very difficult to overcome these things as men without the brotherhood. You really need yeah. the brotherhood you need that. Uh, I, I, I just have one other man that I talk to regularly um, that uh, we just challenge each other. Um, maybe, maybe it's kind of a one-on-one -on -one thing or maybe it's more of a group thing. Whatever your temperament or your personality thrives from, other men is, is that brotherhood that's really important. And usually this would happen between your father and you. That, that would be the normal brotherhood, but because of this generational destruction that we've been talking about, it's more often in our day, more just sort of other peers, men and that type of thing. Yeah. I, uh, fortunately I, you know, my, my dad and I do that with each other, which is awesome, but we're geographically separated, you know, when I joined the military, but you see that in the military, um, especially in the more combat arms, uh, um, you know, jobs where you're actually you know, using arms and, and, and using weapons. Um, I'm an aircraft mechanic, so we don't have <laughs> the same dynamic, but the military is still a, a brotherhood like that too. So yeah, I agree with that 100%. In fact, my Exodus 90 group, um, we're not doing any of the Exodus 90 stuff together anymore, right? But we always see each other in mass. We still call each other at least once a week. Some of us are, are have just started doing the uh, our, our parish priest asked for a security team. So now we're, we're out actually training with an NRA guy to actually, you know, learn how to use our, our weapons. Believe it or not, we do not shoot very often in the military. So a lot of people think we're all guns blazing, but we don't. We shoot once every two years, if that even. So we're out there actually learning this stuff. So again, we're building that, that bond, that brotherhood bond. So that takes care of, so that's, that's us um, kind of spiritually educating ourselves because there's only certain things that other men can challenge us to do. There's that, uh, what do they call that? Oh, man the coming of age kind of, uh, they used to have ceremonies where you had to come of age passage. ceremony. Rite of passage. Thank you. Um, yeah. We don't have those anymore. So it's important to have those with other men. Um, uh, Exodus 90 was a huge rite of passage for many of us. That was tough. <laughs> it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, but, um, but yeah, if anybody hasn't done Exodus 90, I highly encourage them to do it. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, so that takes care of the spiritual aspect 
Um, you know, as father, uh, said, um, so eloquently, uh, more recently, he talked about, you know, the interior life and that's kind of what you're talking about the interior life. Um, so how do we handle the intellectual piece now? So we've got the men challenging us. So if you, Tim, if you were going to challenge me, I came to you, I said, man, I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. I, I, I know this is the truth, but I don't know anything about my faith, really. Like, I know it's true, but I want to dive deeper. Where do I, how do I dive deeper? You know, I know there's a Bible, but I know you're a big proponent of reading another book before the Bible. What book is that? And why is it so important that we read that? Oh, are, are you talking about the imitation? Yeah, the imitation. Oh, right? yeah. So, yeah, the <laughs> imitation. I mean, I think that this book is, is just so massively important. I mean, you really can, you can kind of choose any spiritual work, but this particular one is the most popular. And the reason is because it's so condensed and boiled down into the the basic punches that you need. Mm. Boom, boom, boom. And, and every chapter is easily completed in one day. It's one, every chapter is less than a page, takes 10 minutes to read or less, less than, and it's five minutes, like a five minute chapter every day. And it really focus you focuses you on what is important there there are three pillars of the spiritual life the uh and one of them is spiritual reading so this importance of spiritual reading that is actually fundamental getting that spiritual reading every day and the the scriptures are very difficult i think that uh that's why i wrote this book because they're difficult to make into your spiritual reading unless unless you have us very important framework and the framework really is given by the imitation of Christ Mm -hmm. imitation of Christ breaks it down and gives you that. Um, Mm -hmm. so you need to have the spiritual in place before you tackle the intellectual. That's very important. So if you're going to tackle the intellectual, then the, the good, the great news is that the Roman Catholic church, we've been, our fathers have been dealing with this for 20 centuries and we've boiled the doll down for you. They, they've, they've done it for us, really. And we just need to receive it. We've got to have the piety. Mm-hmm. And so what I would recommend is go to meaningofcatholic.com slash resources. And we basically break down all of the basic sources that you need. And most of them are online for free. And what I would recommend is starting with a simple catechism. You could do Baltimore number three, Baltimore catechism number three, or Pius the 10th catechism. And both of those catechisms you can get for, you can get on audio for free from the IPA app as well. This is oh, the wow. best app out there, in my opinion, for Catholic stuff. And you can just play that on audio. You're going to work, driving to work, just play your Baltimore catechism every day until you get it all done. It's, it's all on audio. Um, and getting that catechism and then, then you, you slowly read through all the most basic catechisms. You've got Baltimore three, you got Pius 10th. And then once you've done those, those are the easiest one because they're question and answer. And then you go to the Roman catechism. That is the big dog, which really breaks it down. And that's really the fundamental catechism. The new catechism of John Paul II is the, the probably the most difficult to understand. It's a lot more complex. Um, so I would not recommend that for beginners. Mm. Um, so getting those works, and then there's a number of other works. Once, I mean, if you've got those catechisms down, then you can branch out into some of the other sources on the resources page, like the Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma by Ludwig Ott, the Prumer's Moral Theology, and those things are a little bit more complicated, but if you start with the catechisms, you can move on to that. So you really have no excuse to not know your faith. You've got audio resources for free. <laughs> you can go out and cut your grass and listen to the Baltimore catechism. You have no excuse. So that is what you need to do. Start with the basics. It's all been laid out for us by our fathers. They've already done the hard work. We just need to receive it. Right on. So yeah, uh, <laughs> we got to put the phones down and pick up a book. 
you know, when you're sitting at line in line at, or sitting at work and you got nothing to do, you know, picking up the phone, playing video games, probably ain't helping us out. Right. So you got to fight that effeminacy. And I, I can't stress that enough. Now more than ever, do we have to learn about our faith? I mean, now more than, I mean, are we going to stop the hemorrhaging? Are we going to stop the uh, seven to 10 Catholic? I mean, maybe, um, but you know, for us, it's got to start at the home. It's got to start with us first. So um, yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because we really do. I, I can't stress it enough, Tim. I really do feel um, that right now is, is, is more important than ever to not only know your faith, but to receive it. You know, a lot of people, like you said earlier, walk around knowing their faith. I probably did that for years. You know, I was really good at apologetics. Yeah, you know, I could explain the faith. No, no kidding. But I, I didn't receive it, you know, in, in, in here, I guess you could say, you know, uh, so to speak. So it was up here. And it, it was it was coming out of my hands, you know, in, in the works I was doing, but it wasn't in here, you know, and it, it you have to pray for that grace as well. So um, the interior life, you know, reading those books, you mentioned before there was two books. Um, I wanted you to hit up again about Father Chad Ripperger. He wrote two real simple books. I don't know if you. you oh, yeah. On hand. Yeah. Another. Yeah, that, that's a that's a good point. I, I forgot to mention Ripperger. Yeah. Um, getting those catechisms, but going to Ripperger is very very good too he has two works that are particularly essential because once you've got these basic works i I would recommend once you read these old catechisms so you're just in the you're just in the old world of our fathers and then once you're you're gonna ready to tackle this this world we're in now then you read repiger and he has two works that are 50 pages or so each so it's very they're very short one is called magisterial authority one is called The Binding Force of Tradition. Mm. And those, those books really, really break down very concisely with a Thomistic thought that's very well documented and explained. The basics of the tradition, wor- how, uh, the tradition, how it works, and what kind of crisis we're in. And it really, really helps those things to really address properly without too much extremes on either side hmm. to really face the doctrinal crisis that we're dealing with now. Gotcha. So those two works as well, 50 pages, they're five, $10 on the internet. Right on. Those Did are essential those reading. Up. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's awesome. I'll try to put those in the show notes as well. That way people can click on the links, um, links there. So to kind of end it on a, on a, on a practical notes, so we've talked a lot about how, the why, kind of the problem and everything. How do we now, once we start learning this stuff, how do we take it to our kids, to our family? How do we help them to receive? Well, the, if you've already been doing all that, you've already, I think, I think already done half the battle because doing it by example is the first important thing because children learn by example. They look and they see you doing something and that's what makes them believe it when you tell them about it. So if they see you praying and then you tell them to pray, they will pray more than they would if they didn't see you praying. That's true. So you got to do it first yourself. And this is something that the father, by his example, has a great impact on his children by just his example. And then you need to lead the family rosary. You need to lead that family rosary to lead them all in prayer. That is the family cultus. And that's the, that is the epicenter of your whole family life is this family prayer where the father leads the family in prayer because it is a, it is a sacramental of your whole life as a family that leading in prayer and it illuminates everything else, both in those, supernatural and natural world of that act and tied with that, obviously taking your family to mass, which is just Mm -hmm. the extension of that family prayer into the Holy sacrifice and the public prayer of the church and doing that, creating that, that custom is, is so essential. And I think that especially for children, we need to get out of our masculine brain and listen to our wives who are inculcating in the children. And, and because I think this is one of the things 
that I mentioned is that uh, men are so hyper rational that they lose sight of what's in front of them, which is the child, especially if a child before the age of reason is simply irrational. And the child needs things like symbols, things like customs, things like weekly rituals, uh, different things like this that children just latch onto because they're not thinking of a bunch of rational things. They're just learning a habit. And that habit, you know, every Martin Mass, we eat goose or whatever. You know, every All, all Souls Day, we all dress up as saints. You know, all these little customs. And these are the types of things that create cultural momentum in the next generation so that they are inclined toward the faith. So these little things which help them grow up, they grow up. So by the time they're, they're reaching the age of reason, they're already tasting the sweetness of the faith because they've tasted the sweetness of your wife's Christmas cinnamon buns every year or whatever. <laughs> you know, they're, they've always looked forward to that, the sweetness of the cinnamon bun. Then they can <laughs> understand the sweetness of the Christ child. And so these, these little things, I think that this is what I'm trying to do with my own family. And, you know, my wife and I are both converts. And so we're, you know, we're trying to learn this ourselves. And so we're trying to inculcate this, this uh, Catholic culture in our family, creating that Catholic culture. And it's difficult because half of it, you have to reinvent because, half of it's oral, just pure oral that our fathers should have taught us, but they didn't because we had the generational breakdown. So we can look at what our fathers did. We can learn at what they did at given time. So we're, for example, this is the ember tide this week or next week, depending on which calendar you're using. And our fathers did certain things for the grape harvest in ember tide, things like that. So how do we take that and we translate it to our modern context? How do we create something new, which is in content continuity with that, but we have to reinvent certain, certain things. We have to really sit down with our wives and think of, well, what can we do? What kind of ritual can we create or invent here? So I think creating that uh, calendar of liturgy in your your family. And this is, this is where a man really needs to especially rely on his wife because his wife is the heart of the home. And this is something that really re revolves around the mother in creating that Catholic home that is essential, creating beauty in the Catholic home. Something that the man, again, is just obtuse about. And so <laughs> getting that, I think, so I guess boiling down your question, I think uh, it is, working together with your wife for the sake of the children and, and creating that base of uh, customs and sweetness and also punishments, you know, <laughs> the sweetness <laughs> and the bitterness for the children, you know, <laughs> so they, so they associate the goodness with the sweetness and the badness with the bitterness, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so, so then, then when they enter the age of reason, they're, they're growing up, then they can really grab hold of the faith and you can really teach them those things. So, that's that mercy justice. Mercy that's justice, that. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that, and that's mercy, something. That, however you look at it. Yeah, it's something that Peter Kwasniewski really brings out in his most recent book about the Latin Mass and how the Latin Mass oh, is yeah. that very thing we're talking about. The Latin Mass is all about signs and symbols, and your senses and and connecting these things to God. It's not about having a Bible study because Bible studies are for adults. The our Lord said, convert and become like your little children. Are you not? Mm -hmm. And enter the kingdom of heaven. So the Latin mass is for little children, that little children seeing everything going on and moving around and all the, the, the vestments and the incense and everything, the asperges, the holy water and everything, all these different things um, that really brings their senses, their sense of the divine, a sense of the supernatural. So that's what I'm working to do in my own family. I'm, I'm a young man. I, I'm not an old and gray, so I don't have it figured out yet, but I, I certainly believe that this is one of the f 
key factors, which I, I work with my wife to develop for our kids. Right on. Right on. Well, how can people get in touch with you? What's the quickest way that people can get in touch with you and what you're doing? You can follow me on Twitter. It's at meaning of Kath. And you can go to meaning of Catholic.com. There is a, uh, up top are all the links for these different things, articles and resources, which I mentioned. There's also one that says contact. So you can contact me there. Excellent. And what's, uh, what's in store for you, Tim? I know you got a book coming up. Anything else? Anything else you want to advertise? Anything keeping under wraps? Uh, well, yeah, I am. I am. <laughs> uh, the plan is God willing to release a book with tan next summer, or actually it'll be in the fall actually. But the, the big thing is Our Lady of Victory Press, which is our publishing, little publishing company with Meaning of Catholic, we are releasing a third book, which is Kennedy's book about, it is a, a book about two devils talking about how they can destroy a family. Oh, and right it's a, a work of fiction. And it is, it's a really great book. I, I hope people will like it because um, Kennedy's done a really great job on it. So so we're going to release that, God willing, October 7 for the Feast of Our Lady of Victory. And so that's coming out very soon. And uh, if you become a patron, then you get that book for free, depending on your level or one of the other, the other books that we publish. And so that's the next project that we're hoping to put out in the next few weeks. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, God willing that... Uh all those timelines meet up and, and we can see those, the fruits of your labor. And I can't think enough to you for, you know, for writing this book. I mean, this book has been, I've had to go back and reread some sections and things like that. I, I love it. You guys, you and Kennedy Hall have a way of uh, writing that's, it, it's deep, but it's easy to di- digest. I, both of you have a, have a knack for that. So I, I appreciate uh, what you guys are doing. Absolutely. Um, so uh, yeah, everyone, please check them out at uh, meaningofcatholic.com. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and close in prayer. I'm going to do the uh, uh, Our Father in Latin. You mind doing the second half? Sure. All right, right on. Nomini Patris et Fili Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in Celi, sanctificetio nomen tuum, et veniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in Celo et in Terra. Panam nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, dimitin nobis debita nostra, sicut in nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos amalo. Amen. Amen. Nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Guys, please come check us out at lumenpatriacarum.org. Um, you can find us on Facebook as well uh, by searching Light of the Patriarchs. Um, we have, we're trying to get some stuff put up there. We've kind of been, uh, lazy over the last week and a half, not lazy. We've had a lot going on. So, uh, but please check us out, get us on uh, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, please share, um, those podcasts, share those articles. Um, I slowly started writing and I'll humbly say that, uh, I don't know if it's reaching anybody, but Hey, whatever, I'm still going to keep writing. So I'll share those articles around and, uh, please stay tuned for more interest, uh, more information about our apostolate. And um, yeah, the more you guys share this stuff, the more it gets around. Go to Meaning of Catholic, share theirs around, become a patron of, of the Meaning of Catholic dot uh, com, and get their stuff moving as well. Um, other than that, stay intentional, my friends. We will see you next time.